Kia ora, and welcome to another teaching from Every Nation Christchurch. For more information and resources, visit everynation.org.nz. Check us out on Facebook or download the Every Nation Christchurch app on Google Play or the App Store. Good morning, everybody. Are you excited to be here? Yes. I'm really, really excited. And uh, with Daryl. Daryl, I'm really sorry. Do you know, while I was watching the game last night, I really, my whole family, we were interceding for you. Because I know your blood is yellow. Um, but I know Daryl is supporting the Lions next yeah. weekend. Any other Lions supporters in the house this morning? For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about rugby. And so, uh, and uh, so it's going to be a great weekend next weekend. But I'm glad you're here this morning. <clears throat> I better put this on. For those of you who are into social media, uh, our church has Instagram. Love you to follow our church Instagram uh, or on Twitter. We do have an app where you can find all the events, what's happening in the life of the church, all our podcasts. They are in audio format and video format, and you will find it on our church app. I want to encourage you. If a message it ministers to you, share it amongst your, your friends as well as your enemies. Um, because they also need to hear the word of God. I thought I'd get one amen. amen. <clears throat> I want to personally invite, if you're a married couple here this morning, uh, to our marriage uh, seminar, course, informal gathering, whatever word you want to use on uh, Tuesday the 7th of August from 7 to 9, the only cost is $10 per couple. And I don't think that's exorbitant because you go can buy a coffee somewhere for $5.50. Um, and so uh, there's no excuses. Um, I'm looking at various people, so watch my eyes. <clears throat> there's no excuses to be there. And really it's, it's for you. And it's to invest in your marriage. Make it a date night. Make it a date night. Go, go to McDonald's beforehand. Come here at 7 o'clock for two hours. And we're just going to have a great time. And often when people think of marriage course, marriage seminar, oh, they're going to get me to talk. You know, most of the time, I'd say about 95% of the time, you're going to be talking to your spouse. And it's about the two of you. It's, it's not about um, putting all your dirty laundry out for everybody to see. But Colin and I want to spend time with you and to sow into your marriage. Your marriage is very important. Yeah. And so I want, we place a high value on marriage. Because we're, what the world is portraying today, that marriage is not important. And I don't believe that. I believe marriage is important. Marriage is from God. And, uh, and so your marriage is very important to to us, and we want to take time to sow into your marriage. Now, I really want to encourage you, if there's a course that should be full, it should be the marriage course. And so I really want to encourage you to be there. Just one other um, uh, course that we're running the following week. How many of you got parents or you've got kids from primary to high school age? Can I encourage you to come along? You know, um, we're going to put a panel together and how many of you know parenting is not easy? How many of you sometimes you want to you want to wring their little necks, but you can't? <laughs> you know, I was uh, I, uh, I helped um, Roscoe, who was helping me with the deck yesterday. Let me tell you, every muscle in my body is aching. Every muscle is aching, and. Uh, and uh, the other day he was there with his dog, and his dog's called Mo. It's this big German Shepherd cross uh, Rottweiler. And, uh, and I said to him, Roscoe, where's your dog? No, he's misbehaving. I'm putting him in timeout. <laughs> <laughs> so timeout is back in the car with the door closed. And you know, it's like parenting. And parenting is not easy. And you know, some, we go to university and study seven years to be a doctor and 12 years to be a surgeon. And, 
And if you're in the building trade or teaching, you know, uh, you are trained and equipped to do your job. But parenting, these kids arrive and we have to look after them. And we have to parent them. And so I really want to encourage you to come along. Learn from people who've gone before you. And it's going to be fun, a lot of laughter, and it's going to be great. We're going to begin a new series today called Renew. Say Renew. Renew. So when I see the title Renew, it means something is old. And we've got to renew something. And it's a three-week series that I'm going to do. And Pastor Nathan is going to be ministering next week. And Pastor John the following week. On a, on a very important topic, which I think we all face, is that is rejection. And so we are going to, we're going to look at real life situations that you and I face. How many of you have faced rejection before in your life? And I'm sure every hand should have shot up. You see, you know, when you... When you, uh, the dictionary definition of rejection is to dismiss as inadequate, unacceptable, or faulty. You know, in life, when you break a leg, it's actually easy to discover. Because they put you in this machine and they say, broken leg, let's join it together with a few screws and bolts. Maybe a bit of glue and your leg can join together. You know, if you've got a common cold, you know, you can blow your nose and, okay, that won't carry on. But... <clears throat> There's certain things that happen to you and I that the symptoms are easily uh, pointed out or to be diagnosed with. But rejection is something very, very different. It's something, something that you can't diagnose with a stethoscope. You can't put a stethoscope on your heart and say, hmm, your problem is rejection. Or, or maybe put it on your head and say, it's your thinking. And rejection is an inside job. Hello? It's an inside job that you and I have to deal with. And we all encounter rejection. You know, we, we, we live in a world where, where people are trying to find a husband and a wife. And most times, uh, in the so-called non-Christian world... You know, when you've had a few alcoholic beverages, you cope with rejection very easily. Why? Because you've been numbed and you have a different spirit in you. First of all, it gives you a boldness. And then when you're rejected by a female, you kind of cope with it. But you know, when we come into the Christian world, where we don't have that spirit, alcoholic spirit operating, the, I find Christian guys... Do not ask girls out because of fear of rejection. So it's kind of like easy in the non-Christian world because you're full of alcohol. But in the Christian world, you, you, kind, of, you kind of struggle. And, and, and as I've done marriage courses and as I've done uh, meeting with young people, this is one of the biggest challenges in the church today, the fear of rejection. And that's why young guys don't pursue anymore. And they think the girl's going to arrive at their doorstep and say, knock, knock, oh, I think you've been praying for me. It doesn't work like that. It only happens in Hollywood like that. In Bollywood. <laughs> and any other world. And sometimes we can we we misinterpret people's motives and we perceive something as rejection. And we have to be very careful and wise that, that we don't perceive what comes our way all the time as rejection. And the important thing is that we have to go to God's word. And I'm gonna read about 21 verses, and so hang in with me. But as I read them, remember our topic is rejection. I want you to see how many points of rejection you can pick up from this passage of Scripture. Okay? And it might be more than what I found, but we, I'm not going to tell you how many I've got. But as I read it, I want you, the framework is rejection. And so we're going to go to John chapter 4 verse 1. 
And this is what it says. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. And he needed to go through Samaria. And I want you to remember this verse, especially that word needed. He needed to go through Samaria. And he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sechar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food from McDonald's. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who, it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well, and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become, become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may drink, uh, nor come here to draw. And Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. And Jesus said to him, to her, woman, oh, I love that, woman, imagine coming to your wife one day, woman, uh, believe in me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem worship the Father, you worship what you do not know, we know what we worship, for salvation is for the Jews, but the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such in worship. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. At this point, his disciples came, and they marveled that, that he talked with the woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek, or what are you talk? sorry, why are you talking with her? A lot of verses, are you okay? Yeah. Hallelujah. How many points of rejection did you pick up in the passage of scripture? How many of you said one? Two? Three? Four? Maybe none. None. Were you, were, you, were you reading the same passage of scripture? <laughs> I want to speak on rejection this morning that impacts every area of our lives. It's there every moment of every day. And in this passage of scripture, I see five. Five points of rejection. <coughs> 
in this passage of scripture. The first one is social. Say social. Social, social rejection. The Samaritan woman went at midday to the well. It's the hottest part of the day. Other women drew water in the morning because it was the coolest part of the day. And she, she wanted to avoid her neighbors, maybe because of all her husbands. Her immorality would be well known to the villagers. You see, friends, just like the story, she encountered rejection in her world and in her environment in which she lived in. And we all encounter social rejection. And for some of you, you might have experienced it. You know, we live in a very different world today than I lived in when I grew up. You know, when I grew up, there was nothing like WhatsApp, Viber. Maybe Viper was a snake, but Viber, the technology. We have nothing like Facebook. Now, you might be thinking, well, Pastor, you are old. I'm only 60. I still remember our telephone, we used to wind up, and then we used to answer it. We have no television. And so the social pressures in my day are very different to the world today. And the social challenges that you and I, and especially our young people, are facing. And let's just, let's just modernize this text for the social. You know, the woman at the well, she had her social issues. That's why she went in the heat of the day. She didn't want to be seen. Nobody drew water in the middle of the day. So let me just isolate myself, get away from my current situation, and so I can go draw, um, draw from water from the well and not be noticed. And you see, this, what ha this is what happens when people encounter social um, rejection. It's called in the modern day term, and, and, and this is very evident in the world today, is cyberbullying. And you can post what you like on the internet. You can tell people to go to H and back. And people use this, and the common word is free speech. I am free to say what I want to say, and it makes no difference if I hurt anybody's feelings. And this is the, the biggest challenge in our world today, is what happens on the internet. Because you and I, and especially the younger people, they live on their devices. They have forgotten how to interact with people. It's easier to, to invite somebody on a date, on a WhatsApp message or Facebook messenger than to have a face-to-face -face conversation and say, would you like to have coffee with me? It's easier to say um, on the internet or, or on a Facebook messenger, we don't want losers at the party. And this is one of the biggest curses in the world today is cyberbullying. I'm sure you have read of articles of people who've committed suicide because of something somebody else has said to them on the internet. You see, sometimes, sometimes our, 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 our rejection is, uh, the words that come against are active and sometimes they're passive. Sometimes the active ones are, are teasing and ridiculing and, and, and bullying, but sometimes they are passive. They, give, they ignore people, and they give people the silent treatment. How many of you have ever had the silent treatment? People do that in a marriage. I remember, and I'm, uh, I'm being transparent with you this morning because I want you to learn. You know, when Colin and I got married, I was a young, immature believer. And when we had a challenge or an argument or, or a misunderstanding and I felt rejected, I gave her the silent treatment. I didn't talk to her for two weeks. Please pray for her. But those, she doesn't have those scars anymore. For two weeks I give her the silent treatment, which was a, a passive way of showing rejection. And here is a woman that I love, and what I did was I gave her the silent treatment. 
Even though we slept in the same bed and we and she would still cook a meal, we would have the meal in silence. It's called the silent treatment. It's a passive way of doing it. And people have and, and when people use words on the internet, etc., it's it, they, they've labeled it as free speech. But so I can't tell you how many people we know who've encountered this kind of challenge. What about your workplace? Bullying in your workplace. Feeling rejected in your workplace. Maybe you didn't get that promotion. Maybe you applied for a job and you didn't get it. Maybe you asked the girl out and she said no. Or maybe you didn't. Maybe you heard via the grapevine the reason why you said no because you smell. There's so many things. There's so many things that that what people say or don't say, how we can perceive it as a rejection. Fear of rejection makes us withdraw from crowds and become isolated. This is the devil's plan right from the Garden of Eden. Right from the Garden, it doesn't change. Throughout the generations, God's pl sorry, the devil's plan for your life is to isolate you. When he isolates you, he can do what he wants with you. So when it comes to rejection, what people do is, okay, uh, I don't want to put myself in that situation for fear of rejection, so I'm not going to go there. And then what happens is people withdraw, and then what you draw, you stay in your holy huddle at home, and, and your whole world revolves around you, myself, and I. Devil's plan. Got to break it in Jesus' name. Amen? The second thing we see in this in this passage of scripture is racial. Say Rachel. I mean racial, not Rachel. Rachel. Maybe I need to have some water. Let's write that down. Apologies if your name is Rachel here this morning. Verse 9 says. Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Racial. Racial. The Samaritans have become what some people, the commentators call, saying the misraced, or, or the uh, Jews saw them as an impure race. And, and it's, it, it happened in, in biblical times. Guess what? One of the biggest curses in the world today is racial rejection. Racial. I mean, I come from a country that labeled it apartheid. But let me tell you something. Wherever I go in the world, I see and I witness racial challenges. No matter where I go. Often, I still remember Colleen said to me when we came to New Zealand, why is God calling us to New Zealand? We need to be in Africa and deal with this the spirit of, of, of just racism in our country and, and, and whatever. Let me tell you something. When I came here, I saw racism in Christchurch, New Zealand. I saw it in New Zealand. What is racism? Racism is where you see yourself better than somebody else. And I think to myself, man, I'm a white South African man. You know, uh, I'm better than Filipinos. And I'm better than, where's Dave, where's, where's Dr. Bernard? I'm better than Ghanaians. I'm better than Americans. I'm better than Koreans. That's racism. Guess what? I'm going to burst your bubble if you think that way. There it is. This is for free. You're not better than anybody else. Right. And I want to encourage you, if you grew up in a world and an environment where you were conditioned to think a particular way, I want to encourage you, I want you to deal with that in Jesus' name. Because in the kingdom of God, we are all one. Yeah. You will, you, when you go to heaven one day, there is no Korean heaven. There's no Fijian heaven. There's no Samoan heaven. 
Guess what? We are all going to be together. So we better get used to it right here. And when you start thinking that I'm better than somebody else, another group of people, there's something wrong with your conditioning and there's something wrong with your thinking. And if you come from a culture where you think, oh, these people are better, I pray that you break that thinking in Jesus' name. Amen? Racial rejection starts when people take pride in their own identity as a people, organization, or class, and they begin to look down on other people. There's nothing wrong by saying, you know what, I'm going to support the Lions next week because I am South African. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm not saying that I'm a better white South African man than a, a New Zealand man like Brent or, or, or Nathan. <coughs> Because in God's sight, he says, we are neither Jew nor Gentile. But we are one in God. Turn to the person next to you and say, did you get that? You see, people of other groups look down upon themselves and become insecure. I remember, I remember when we bought this building. I bought this building and we were painting downstairs. And I still remember Francis came to me. And I was painting. And he said, Pastor, no, no, you mustn't paint. I said, I'm not an invalid. I've got two hands. I've got a bit of energy still in me. I can paint. You see, for Francis, it's kind of like, oh, no, no, the pastor mustn't paint. He must go and he study and read his Bible and pray. Listen, I'm more than just reading my Bible and praying. I can work on a deck. I look at my hands, I've got splinters today. These soft hands are now becoming hardened in Jesus' name. Friends, I want us to be a church that keeps building bridges. Let's not blow up bridges between cultures or generations. Let's be bridge builders. I, I really challenge you in the next two months, find somebody from another culture and invite them into your home and have a, and bake and cook something for them that's your speciality. And if you invite Colin and I, but only uh, there's no pumpkin. <laughs> it's all I say. Because it impacts my health. <laughs> Let's be bridge builders. Let us set the example for this nation of New Zealand. Where people say, you know, every nation, Christ Church, they are bridge builders. They're building across the cultures. They, they are one. There's no separation of, all well, I'm this and I'm that and I'm this other thing. Man, we are all one. Number three, religious. The Samaritans were publicly cursed in the synagogues. They could not be converted to Judaism as a proselyte or excluded from the af afterlife. When people can't live up to expectations by their Christian families or the church, people feel rejected. Non-Christians often feel dirty or not yet ready or what people think. What do people think of me? You see, friends, as a, as a church family, Number one, I, 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 I pray that I will never ever speak against other churches. Because why? We, we need more churches in the city. There are over 400,000 people here. And, and the statistic is only 10% are Christian. You know, there's still another 300,000 people to be reached. I'm, I'm, I'm up for that. I'm up for that. You see, we need to create an environment at church where people will not feel rejected if they walk. You see, sinners will walk into the house of God. And our job is to not to make them feel guilty. Let the Holy Spirit convict them. You see, for our, our responsibility is that we need to show love. Say love. love. You know, I will love, if you're breathing and you're living, I will love you. You see, but I might not agree with your sin, but I love you as a person. 
And I will teach you from God's word and let the Holy Spirit deal with your sin issues. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. Because I want people to feel loved in the house. Number four, gender. Say gender. Gender. Okay, ancient practices look down on men speaking at, at length to any woman. Verse 27 says, his disciples were surprised to find him talking with another woman. Now in some cultures and, and in ancient uh, Mediterranean culture, it disapproved of men speaking to women privately. In some cultures, it's, it's frowned upon if, if a male was speaking to another female. But here, Jesus broke that completely because he took time to speak to this woman. Now, I don't know what your culture's like, but I know in some cultures, uh, the patriarchal um, culture is that they don't encourage men to speak to women. So I'm not, I don't know what the right thing is. If you're married, it's different. You see, I'm not going to meet with a, another woman at 12 o'clock at night and do a counseling session. How many of you know that's wrong? I had one of my leaders many, many years ago in Cape Town, so not here, so please don't look around. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, they, him and the, one of the other leaders said, you know, Pastor, we're praying until three in the morning. Oh, we just love praying, interceding for our city and our nation. We want Jesus to come, hallelujah. Two months later, the girl was pregnant. He took body ministry to the extreme. <laughs> If I, have, if I have to see someone, I will do it in private. If I have to see somebody at the office, I make sure, if it's female, I make sure Vanolia or there's somebody else present in the office. Otherwise, it's a public place where there are lots of other people, if I have to see someone. You see gender. You see, we really face, you, I mean, the, the young people of today face massive challenges. Because what happens for males is, is they look at Bollywood and Hollywood and they look at these cool dudes. They look at these amazing, well-groomed, uh, maybe even sports stars like David Beckham. And, and they want to have their hair like David. Just that bristly beard. <laughs> Just abs showing. And it's like, oh my goodness, I, I, my star, I want to look like my star. You know, and it puts the guys under so much pressure. You see, let me carry on. You know, the women, they look at fashion magazines. And they look at these amazing, beautiful women. Guys, let me tell you something. Ladies, look at me. A lot of these women are photoshopped. They might be this size. But you know, Photoshop can give you that size. But it's kind of like... Let's not model ourselves because then you feel rejected. Then you feel insecure. And you look, I can never look like that person. And so I'm going to feel miserable. A lot of us watch, watch movies like, uh, or series like The Bachelorette and The Bachelor and all these other us. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like we look at these things and we try and live like that. It happens. You see, you watch Hollywood movies and you can see, wow, that guy picked up that date quite quickly. Then if it happened in the movie, it's going to happen to me. Let me burst your bubble. It doesn't happen in reality. They gender challenges. Lastly, there's moral. Verse 18 says, the man you now have is not your husband. You see, friends, in the Jewish culture, held at that time a woman might be divorced twice or three times at the most and if the Samaritans had the same standard this woman's life had exceeded the quota of numbers two or three she said she had five husbands and so immorally you see for us today this generation tries to hide their guilt by being a loud clanging symbol that it is good practices and it's normal. Let me put it in context. 
You know, and if you're in high school, this is what I've heard dealing with young people. If you're not sleeping around, something's wrong with you. And what happens because you've embraced the standard for your life, and you say, I'm not going to do it, you get rejected by your peers and say, you're not normal. It's okay to take drugs. Just try it once or twice. No. Well, then you can't be my friend. Rejection. And so then I want to encourage you. Let's keep the standards that God has for us. Let's not bow to what society is forcing us. Because society and the digital age and the social media age is trying to force you and I into a particular mold. And as I said, social media is good, but it also has a very bad side to it. And we have to be very, very careful. Let me share three quotes with you and then I'm going to summarize. If you're struggling with rejection, rejection doesn't mean you aren't good enough. It means the other person failed to notice what you have to offer. Amen? Yeah. Never apologize for having high standards. People who really want to be in your life will rise up to meet them. Let that sink a little bit. Every time I thought I was being rejected from something good, I was actually being redirected to something better. Come on, those are three powerful quotes that can be life-changing for you if you truly believe. You might be sitting here this morning, and you might be shouting, Help! And friends, we all face rejection. I, as a pastor, face rejection. I remember many, many years ago, people were in this church and, oh, pastor, we love you and give me a hug and give me a kiss and, and yo, man, we're excited for what God is doing here and thank the Lord Jesus that God brought you from Cape Town to be here in New Zealand and the next week they're gone. And I thought, oh my goodness, is it me? Maybe they want a younger pastor like Pastor Nate. Maybe they want a 30 year 32 year 34? <laughs> Maybe they don't like my preaching. Maybe they got tired of my jokes. And what used to happen and is that I used to take it personally. Because I felt rejected. Because I'm actually quite a nice guy. Get to know me. Don't eat pumpkin. Everything else is fine. <laughs> I'm actually quite a nice guy. I love sport. I love golf. I love my motorbike. I love my wife. In that order. No, I'm only joking. Right <laughs> first. And then the others. <laughs> oh, now she's really rejected. <laughs> you see, friends, look at the screen. You see, if, if your internal, listen to this, this is for free. If your internal is less than your external, you're going to come crashing when it comes to rejection. It's going to crumble you. You have to focus on your internal. Because if I had to worry about it, because person leaving, I said, oh, poor me. And the whole plan of the devil is to isolate me and become miserable and depressed and just go home and sleep all day. Devil's plan. I have to make sure that my internal is greater than my external. How do we do that? You see, let's learn from the story. What did Jesus do? He pursues us. Remember that verse I said, remember this? He said, I need to go to Samaria. <coughs> God, God is coming into your life. He wants, he's, he's, he's pursuing you this morning. That you don't have to deal with this rejection anymore. That, that, that when he fills you up, that <coughs> something happens in your life. Say, God, pers Jesus pursues me. Jesus. So when, he, when the verse says, I need to go to Samaria, right there, I need to go. I put your name. I need to see John. I need to see Mary. I need to see Jacob. We then see that he accepts us. 
you know, against all cultural norms and rejection and all those patterns that I've just spoken about, He accepts us at our point of need. I want you to know by the Spirit of God, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're feeling this morning, Jesus Christ accepts you as you are today. And you need to respond to that love and acceptance that we see that Jesus has to offer. You know, one thing I've learned about God is not conditional love. It's unconditional love. It's not about what you do or what you think and have you given to the building fund and have you loved Auntie Mary or anything like that. He loves you unconditionally. And friends, let me tell you, if I took the mic to every single person here, you, I'm sure you can tell me a challenge or struggle you're facing today. Why? Because it's part of life. But I want you to know by the Spirit of God that He accepts you. Thirdly, He satisfies us. I'm not so bad to come. He satisfies us. And he says the following, he says, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give, you will never thirst again. Sorry, uh, if you drink of the water that I give, you will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. You see, friends, I want you to hear this this morning. And you'll hear it over the next three weeks. The fountain, the water that Christ gives us, will never run dry. Do you know the water that comes from heaven, that everlasting water, has got no chlorine in it? It's not like the Christ Church water. You don't have to put it in a container and first filter it and then drink it. The water that Christ gives is everlasting, say everlasting. And when he fills you up, it will it will be a, a water spring into everlasting life. It will just continue to flow and to flow and to flow and to flow. What makes you cope when you face rejection? You have to be filled with the everlasting water. He pursues you, you need to accept it, and you have to drink from the fountain that never runs dry. You see, you've got to drink in order for it to never run dry. It's every moment of every day you drink. So when you face with a text message, the spirit in you rises up and you can walk over that. And the Bible is your filter. Everything I hear today that's negative about me and there's very few things is I've used God's word as a filter. And if it passes the filter, I accept it. If it doesn't pass it, just like we put the water, the chlorine, the, the filter takes out all the chlorine and we're left with beautiful New Zealand water. Make that filter God's word. And you face the situation at work, whatever, use God's word as a filter. Rise up that everlasting water, let it flow. Let's all stand together.